Hey everyone, welcome to Flywheel Pod, your number one source for everything Frax, DeFi, and everything in between. If you want to know what's going on in the world on chain, you've come to the right place. This is DeFi Dave here with Capital K. We're here to help you harness the power of the flywheel and talking about adding to the Fra Frax flywheel in a huge way. This episode was all about Frax ETH. We had their lead dev on, Jack Cordry. Um, and there were, was a lot of alpha. I know we say that every episode. I think, Kit, me and you have done a really great job of being able to extract alpha from our guests. But, like, this one was just, like, everything you need to know. Like, the same way with, like, Frax Land, like, everything you knew about Frax Land. And this was everything you need to know about Frax ETH. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, Dave and I tried to drill in deeper to get the details for you guys. And yeah. I think we managed to squeeze them all out. Uh, and like, make sure you tune in until the very end to know when... It comes yeah, out. when like no, and like when Kit says like we drilled every little detail of him, we did. We go from everything to like how it's structured, who's running the validators, you know what, you know how their system compares to other ETH the fees. staking derivatives, the fees. Like we like we're very thorough in this episode. We cover like no like detail is not like unturned no pages unturned and so this is a really cool episode i'm this is probably the frax product i'm most excited for and i think like the number one thing to take from this is like you know all these each taking derivatives are just stable coins and who's like who has like the infrastructure for stable coins and ev on every part of the stack it's frax so like dude frax the, the, coming yeah. up the <laughs> moment you guys said that like you know you know, Frax ETH is really just a stable coin that's pegged to ETH. Yeah. And my, in my mind, every piece is just clicked. You know that meme yeah. when it's like the light bulb it's going like, and it's just <sighs> infinitely exploding? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's funny. I remember being at the, you know, hosting the first Fraxless meetup at DevConnect in Amsterdam. We actually got, it was 15 of us. We got Sam on FaceTime. And, and this was in April. And that's when he first announced Frax ETH, I think, in a public way. It was like, we're actually looking into this, like, because what is the need staking derivative, like Lido, other than a stable coin, we think we can build our own version of this as wow. well. And so, like, that was in April. We're now in October. I, I can't do math right now. Maybe it was, like, five, six months since, it, like, since, like, idea to now. Like, Frax team, once again, ships in record time with safety in mind. <laughs> safe ship is the best ship okay y'all yeah. practice Fra safe the shipping ship, the ship is always <laughs> moving <laughs> and speaking of moving let's get this episode going uh don't forget if you're on youtube hit that bell if you want the alpha hit that bell so you get those notifications uh over and over again don't forget to subscribe to us we're at 900 subscribers now we're almost at 1k come on guys get us to 1k that would be huge um you can follow us on Twitter at Flywheel Pod. Join our Telegram group at Flywheel Pod. We're getting a little bit of a crew in there. It's pretty cool to see. Um, follow me on Twitter at Day 22 You can follow me at 0x capital underscore K. And let's get the Flywheel spinning. Hey everyone, welcome back to Flywheel Pod. This week we go back to our roots. We go back to the source. We have on Frax Core Dev Jack Cordry, who has been in a cave deep down in validator central studying up everything there is to know about each staking um frax you i mean jack you've been with the team for a bit um can you tell us a little bit about yourself who you are how you got into frax and what you just what you think about the eth staking landscape in general uh yeah hi um jack uh, I've been working at Frax now for almost a year. I started kind of getting involved with the team last fall uh, and kind of started working full time there at like uh, over over the winter. Um, I am a still a student at UCLA. I'm a fourth year finishing up my last kind of things. I see that pipeline from UCLA to, to Frax is still pretty Real strong. strong. Real yeah. strong. <laughs> the roots there. Um, and I, you know, see, I first touched Bitcoin in like 2017, um, but I didn't really get into it technically and into the like dev side of it until, uh, spring of 2021, which was kind of the beginning of, or earlier in, I don't know if you can call that bull market. I, I guess you can. Spring um, of 2021, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. um. My my dates get all mixed together, <laughs> but honestly, time uh, goes fast. They all like yeah. just mesh in, honestly. Yeah, it really hasn't been that long, but it feels like an eternity almost. And uh, 
yeah, just kind of something struck me about it with everything that was happening in the markets at the time. And I just decided, I, I realized, uh, you know, you can become an expert on Solidity and kind of like a, a blockchain tech, even as like a young person such as myself and kind of rise to the top. <laughs> uh, so I like dropped everything and just like spent 100% of my time just grinding uh, Solidity and everything. So and you saw the opportunity possible. and you jumped on it. Yeah, I think, you know, I saw a lot of other people my age who were doing similar things like programming Solidity. Uh, and I kind of realized that like, look, there's tons of demand for people who know how to build these like smart contracts and work on DeFi and all stuff. And uh, that combined with the fact that it's kind of a natural intersection of my interests, I was like, you know, I could really see myself shining here. So I, I just, I full sent it. Um, you, you full sent it and it landed you on the Frax ETH island. And so can you explain to our viewers, you know, actually like what ETH staking is and what Frax ETH is and why it's important to the Frax ecosystem? For sure. Yeah. So let's see how, uh, how technical should I go on like what ETH staking is? Just go however you need to describe it. All right. I think for the uninitiated, uh, we just saw the merge happen, which switched proof uh, or which switched Ethereum over from a proof of work security system over to proof of stake. Um, meaning we you can lock up 32 ETH at a time on the beacon chain and run a validator node um, and help secure it, <laughs> I guess. See, it's been it's been a long time since I've had to explain. I guess like proof of stake, so I'm pr probably doing a bad job. But dude, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> thirty two ETH, uh, you stake it. You know, you secure the network with the thirty two ETH, and from that, all these different you know staking platforms and organizations have popped up. Whether they're centralized like Coinbase or quote unquote decentralized like Rocket Pool or somewhere in the middle like Lido, and mm -hmm. you know, Frax saw an opportunity there because you know at the end of the day they're all stable coins, but instead of being pegged to a dollar, they're pegged to ETH, right? Yeah, exactly. So I guess to, to run with that a little bit, yeah, you see all these, you know, stake ETH staking derivatives pop up, such as you mentioned, uh, Rocket Pool, there's, there's Lido staked ETH, there's Coinbase ETH. Um, and they all come from kind of the demand that it's hard to run a validator. 32 ETH is a lot of money for most people. Uh, and it is also, you know, non-trivial to actually run a validator. There is, you know, you, if you make mistakes, you can get slashed. You can not have a hundred percent uptime. You, there's a lot of kind of, uh, technical steps that you need to, you know, technical hoops you need to jump through in order to effectively run a validator. So you're seeing increasingly, or so increasingly you're seeing people trust, you know, staking derivatives or centralized staking or staking as a service, also these sorts of other methods to go about doing it. Um, of which we plan to be one of. And like you mentioned, uh, it fits very natively into the Frax ecosystem because ultimately you look at all these different staking derivatives and they're all, I think people haven't realized it yet, but they're all just stable coins, which we are very good at. Um, you know, all these staking derivatives are really just uh, a stable coin that's pegged to uh, one to one ETH. And uh, uh, most of their functions of, you know, they need to be able to do X, Y, and Z are, are uh, you know, overlap a lot with a stable coin design. And so I'm really excited about the project because I think it will uniquely leverage a lot of our uh, strengths as a, as uh, the Frax protocol and like the Frax industry or not the industry, the ecosystem that we've kind of built. Everything that we have kind of all ties together and uh, gives us advantages in the other things that we have. And a lot of those kind of lend themselves to building a staking derivative, so yeah. Yeah, now let's get into the details of Frax ETH and feel free to go like as detailed as you want and I'll do my best to like simplify it for people. So can you explain like Frax ETH, what's the design of Frax ETH and you know, maybe like why did you make those design decisions? For sure, so the, the biggest one is that uh, it's a two token design. So there's uh, two tokens, there's Frax ETH, which functions as the stablecoin pegged to ETH. And then there's S Frax ETH, which is stands for staked Frax ETH. And that is the actual token that accrues staking rewards. So uh, that's kind of important to know because if you're someone who, you know, you convert your 
uh, ETH to FRAX ETH or you, you buy FRAX ETH on the open market, you're not actually generating any staking yield. You're only, uh, you're just holding a, a, a ETH stablecoin. So, so very much like, uh, like WEATH, a wrapped ETH, which is a BRC20 compliant wrapper around Ethereum. Um, FRAX ETH is kind of our native WEATH or uh, you can think of it like, you know, ETH, an ETH stablecoin or ETH within our ecosystem, um, which is really important because it kind of unlocks a lot of ability for us. You know, if you think of, oh, you have WEATH, which is, you know, ERC20 ETH, uh, and that allows you to use ETH within kind of the, you know, DeFi stack. Uh, you can, if you have FRAX ETH, you're kind of able to use ETH within the FRAX stack um, as well as anywhere else, obviously, because it's, Ultimately, the same thing. Uh, the second part of the two token system is the SFRAX ETH. And that is a, for the technically inclined, an ERC4626 vault, um, where you actually kind of, you, it's, you can think of it like you're depositing your FRAX ETH into a vault, the vault being the SFRAX ETH contract. And then that is what generate or is, receives the rewards. And then over time, you have you're able to redeem your S frax ETH for an increasing amount of frax ETH. So, because uh, I guess that's a, a lot to digest to mm -hmm. kind of explain what that looks like is you, say you have one frax ETH, you deposit it in S frax ETH, so now you have one S frax ETH. And then over time, say we generate, you know, over X period of time, we have, you know, 5% staking yield. Uh, at the end of that period, you could redeem your S frax ETH for 1.05 frax ETH. Um, so functionally works exactly the same, uh, but the important part is that isolates the volatile token uh, from the stable token. You know, our, our FRAX ETH will always be one-to-one -one pegged and SFRAX ETH can float and have the increasing exchange rate. Uh, and that's really important because there, you know, there's benefits to, you know, both designs where you have, you know, there's certain things that you can only do with a stable asset and certain things you can only do with the, you know, vault asset. And uh, a lot of other designs that have one token uh, kind of make some sacrifices because of it. Um, not to nitpick, but, or not to pick on, on Lido, but for example, Steeth is a rebasing token. Um, and also for people who have worked with smart contracts know that uh, rebasing tokens are notoriously hard to kind of iter integrate with a lot of things because, you know, if you send a bunch of steeth somewhere, uh, you need to guarantee that, or, you know, you, a lot of contracts assume that the amount that you sent is the amount that it now has, you know, it increases its eternal balance by, you know, you send it 10 steeth, it thinks it has 10 steeth now. And if, you know, uh, 10 blocks later or whatever, uh, steeth rebases and all of a sudden now it has 11 steeth, it might break some of the logic of the contract. Um, so by not having a rebasing token, we kind of avoid a lot of those problems. And I, I think Lido actually has like a wrapped version, which isn't rebasing, but um, it's nice that this will kind of work for us out of the box. Uh, and then additionally, that allows us to have things like, you know, we can still have our curve stable pool um, between like an ETH, FRAX ETH stable pool. Um, and I'm blanking on other things, but it's, it's kind of a frax line too. Like once you can get like a frax line pair of frax ETH coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll definitely, that, that's one of the great things about uh, frax ETH and kind of one of our unique, I guess, value adds is, you know, because we have this, we've been calling it the, the DeFi trinity of, you know, frax land, frax swap and, and frax itself. Uh, frax ETH automatically has uh, compatibility with all those things. It's going to be spun up on all those immediately. Wait, um, let's let's uh, like hone in on that point. So mm -hmm. Frax already has the DeFi Trinity, which it's deploying for Frax, the stablecoin, at you know basically all these different parts of the stack that Frax owns and all these different parts of the stack Frax is using to maintain its peg. Now mm -hmm. it's going to use it to for Frax ETH and not only help maintain Frax ETH's peg, but also earn yield on that Frax ETH. Is that the right way to put it? Uh, I think so. Yeah, like. Um... Yeah, you want a lot of times when someone's launching a new product, you this is kind of part of our, uh, I guess, rationale behind the DeFi Trinity is this, you need to, it's like you, you don't really have it fully set up until it's, you know, you can launch a token, but no one can really access it unless it's on a DEX. And if mm -hmm. it's on 
more decks, you should be able, you should have access to leverage, you should be able to borrow, you should be able to lend, you should have more kind of like yield primitives, and so you should have a like a, a lending market for it too, which is Frax Lend. Uh, and if you're launching something that's not a stable coin, you know, you need to pair it against something. Um, you need stable value somewhere, so you need the stable coin asset. And so I think Sam at one point called it kind of like DeFi in a box. It's like unless you have DeFi, your asset can't actually do anything. Um, so by having, you know, our Trinity, we have DeFi in a box and automatically we just, you know, I wouldn't call it click a button, but out, out of the box, it's already the full stack. You can do everything that you would do in DeFi, uh, because we have all three parts. Yeah. And, and I think, and, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, ask the, go ahead. Okay. Okay, I, I'll go because this is a, a quick question. Is it possible for someone to say bet between uh, Rocket Pool versus Frax ETH that you guys can earn more yield? Could they then swap our ETH into Frax ETH to then get S Frax ETH? That's kind of like a Paris trade, some way somehow. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's kind of two parts of that, or there's like two ways to kind of answer mm -hmm. that, I suppose. Um, the first is, uh, which one do I want to do first? <laughs> uh, okay, I think the more, oh, okay, because both of these have, are bo both open kind of cans of worms that, or not cans of worms, they're, they're really interesting points of topic, and I, I'm like a rabbit hole, I'm sure we're going to go down. Um, the first one is the technical limitations of staking derivatives themselves, where uh, we could, we can do that, you know, and this isn't something that's going to be or available off launch, but... Um, you know, you, you could have potentially in the future, like we, you collateralize Frax ETH with Rocket Pool ETH or with Steeth or something like that. Um, won't, won't be an immediate function, but it's something that potentially we could have. Um, <clears throat> but there's a limitation to that because you, ultimately that means that, you know, Rocket Pool ETH or Steeth are still the ones running the validators and that ETH will still be kind of outside of our ecosystem outside of the, you know, the Frax ETH system um, until withdrawals are active. So uh, if you're converting, so you, you can't really convert, you know, your Rocket Pool ETH for a Frax ETH because ultimately you're, you know, the validators, nothing has changed. And the, you know, until withdrawals are active, you won't be able to actually, you know, unstake from one protocol and restake with the other. So that's a limitation of kind of being able to just naturally like move. Um, uh, but, and the second point, which is even more interesting, what we will have is, uh, yeah. Oh, this is, this is cool. There's, uh, one of our recent things that we've launched is, you know, Frax baseball, uh, where we have our, you know, Frax USD coin pool on curve, which is massive because it allows us to kind of uh have very deep liquidity and then give deep liquidity to other tokens who pair against frax base pool um and you know frax we've always been extremely positive sum and wanted to you know wanting to create things that benefit everyone that's kind of been one of our main uh ways of doing that is you know we're able to give all these other protocols very deep liquidity through frax base pool which also benefits us because it naturally organically increases frax demand and all those things you know ultimately uh, Frax's bread and butter has been deep liquidity, right? We've gotten very good at the at the curve game, uh, the convicts game, and you know having our our pools have very deep liquidity, and that is ultimately one of the huge benefits of uh, uh, we or not benefits of, but that answers your question of you know if I'm going to swap between one protocol to the other, um, you know we can have uh, deep liquidity pools paired against you know Frax or uh, a Frax ETH base pool, you know, where we have our Frax ETH ETH pair and pair that against other ETH staking derivatives. And so in the same way that our vision for Frax BP is to be kind of the central liquidity hub for all stable coins, uh, Frax ETH ETH pool, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not very good at naming it, um, can be the liquidity hub for all staking derivatives. And I think that would be really incredible wow. and is definitely kind of the direction that we're trying to push things. Frax are there ETH based pool? Is, are there meta pools yet for like ETH? There's meta pools for stables, obviously, but there aren't meta pools yet for ETH derivatives, right? It's more they're all just factory pools, right? I am not sure. I don't. I don't want to say one way or the other because I might be wrong. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't see why not. Like they can't be like a base pool for each staking derivatives because you know I feel like Frax. When we've talked about this, Frax is really good at seeing where like the wind is heading. You mm. know, they were the first ones on like curve doing the curve wars, convex super early, accumulated convex early, number one holder of convex, and now they're going they're going from the application layer to the consensus layer. And this is Frax basically planting its fra- fra- flag quite literally on the real estate of the Ethereum blockchain. And so, oh, it's going to be really interesting to see like. If you can, I guess that's something to ask, like, the Curve guys or Sam, like, is could there be, like, a ETH base pool, per se? Like, maybe it's with, like, all, like, the major ETH assets. Because I feel like since Frax is going this direction, I guarantee you in, like, six months, other protocols are going to be going this direction. And you're already seeing it, like, with Coinbase. They're not even a protocol, but they're a centralized exchange. They have Coinbase ETH. I'm surprised there, there would be, like, a Kraken ETH or a Binance ETH or FTX ETH. Like, there's no reason why, like, they all can't do it. Hell, there could be, like, a block daemon or figment eth because they're like they're literally validators themselves right um yeah sam always likes to say you like skate where the puck is going not where the puck was and mm-hmm. i think that's very true i mean you are seeing uh yeah coinbase eth i think on curve i think they're trying to set up a, a curve pool will um, coinbase enter the curve wars Ooh. <laughs> I, I think so I, i'm i hope i didn't imagine that <laughs> i guess that was pretty big news if i i'm not but no, i uh, think that it's announced mm. And then, uh, yeah, just kind of you're seeing that across the board. And I, I think that kind of vision of, you know, that, that's ultimately one of the big uh, strengths of Frax ETH is, you know, we've already, you know, I don't know if you want to say we've won the curve war or whatever. We've, we've gotten very good at the curve game. And that ultimately is going to be uh, extremely valuable for Frax ETH and for all of the, you know, stable coin or ETH stake and derivatives because we can be positive some through, uh, you know, a Frax yeah. ETH base pool. I think um, like the way you set up your design for Frax ETH with like the two token system and kind of the, the stockpile of reserves you have with CVX and CRV, you have a bunch of really powerful tools at your disposal to really generate the most yields possible for those who participate in Frax ETH. Because since it's a two token system, not all Frax ETH is going to be in S Frax ETH, but all the ETH in the system will be gaining yield. So mm-hmm. in this case, there'll always be like a baseline of like fra- of ETH of like ETH rewards being earned by S Frax ETH. Meanwhile, if that Frax ETH is put into like the curve pools like fr- Frax ETH ETH, then you can use your curve and C- CVX voting power to direct rewards there, and you can really like superpower yield in ways not seen possible in these like liquid staking derivative wars per se so Mm -hmm. is that like a good assessment and would you have you guys estimated the yield what the yield's going to look like for this at all yeah so uh that that's one of the really exciting things about uh frax eth is i we really do expect the frax eth yield or the s frax eth yield to be uh significantly higher than your kind of average um uh, ETH staking derivative, you know, yield um, for a number of reasons. One, uh, most other staking derivatives, or if you're staking ETH on your own, is it's just the staking yield. Um, you're just earning the kind of validator fees and your block proposal rewards and whatnot. Uh, with Frax ETH, we also have it hooked into this whole ecosystem. So you're earning yield from, you know, Frax Lend, Curve, Frax Swap, all these different things. Uh, depending or and you know not as a or, or let me get into what that means there's because of the two token design uh, where we have you know s frax eth is going to be receiving the staking rewards and frax eth is a stable coin um, the curve pool which is a, going to be a stable pool will be a frax eth eth pool so it will not be the s frax eth and so what that means is, uh, as we you know incentivize that pool, the yield for that pool goes up, um, and it becomes more you know juicy to go to uh, to instead of staking your frax ETH with S frax ETH, you put your frax ETH in the curve pool, uh, which then means because behind the scenes all the ETH is in you know validator nodes, 
uh, the people who do have their yield or their their ETH, their FRAX ETH in S FRAX ETH now see increased yield uh, from the validator rewards because not all of the FRAX ETH is locked up in the staking contract. Um, so it's this interesting kind of design where the, the yield on the S FRAX ETH contract is uh, like the, the floor for the amount that you can be getting is the normal staking yield. It's like a treasury bond. It's like how treasury bonds back uh, USDC and the USDC itself is not like earning yield, but like behind it, like the bond behind the scene is like the same thing with Frax ETH. You have like it behind the scenes, like earning yield, but the F, the Frax ETH itself does not like, you know, earn yield. Mm -hmm. But instead of uh, not to not to dig USD coin, <laughs> love USD coin, but um, the uh, we will actually be distributing like instead of the treasury bond kind of funding, uh, you know, the stable coin, which, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> Uh, you know, USD coin is always one one pegged with, you know, the dollar um, and they have their benefits on the you know stable side of things with. What am I trying to say? <laughs> you were right. <laughs> the yield will necessarily be higher because under the behind the scenes, you know, there are there is kind of the stable coin aspect, which is analogous to USD coin, where we have this thing that's one one peg. But behind the scenes, it's all generating yield uh, mm -hmm. like circles, you know, treasury bonds. Yeah. And, but since we are distributing all of that to, I mean, there will be uh, a very, very small fee, but uh, very, whatever, but the, you know, all of that behind the scenes yield is getting distributed to the S FRAX ETH people. Um, Boosted yields. Yeah. Off the bat. I love this yeah. design. Like this yeah, is such yeah. a no brainer design. I'm surprised other like staking derivatives haven't done it. Um, I know that, you know, you mentioned, Lido, their rebasing token, they chose that design. The Rocket Pool guys, their design, it's just one token, our ETH, and that ETH, they do some calculation, and just by holding it, you earn yield. And so it, you don't have to snake it anywhere. I'm not sure of the other details of it. I just know that's the case. There's no two token system. Coinbase, I believe, is just like a two, to like one token, and it's actually like circle. <laughs> like there's like some centralized entity holding it somewhere you know, earning yield, blah, blah, blah. But with Frax, you have, you know, back to this like one commandment of everything on chain, you have the vault on chain and you can see it earning yield, which is, you know, really cool, super DeFi native. I feel like Fra it's, it's really funny because Frax for the past year and a half has been practicing how to like build the ultimate like pegged asset and building this pegged asset infrastructure. And it's going to come into great use and like incredible use for ETH. Like now is like another time for it to shine it is like for this like whole like liquid staking derivative LSD um, war that's come. I wouldn't say war, but like, you know, mm. like there was a curve I wars, think... but like, you can't, you can't, how, what are you thinking? Like my mind's spinning. Dude, I, I can tell, I can tell. Uh, Jack, I just want to say you and the Frax team are crazy, crazy folks over there. <laughs> I feel like what you guys created was a almost a pseudo way to bribe more ETH native yield. Cause let's assume just, you know, it's easier to work with extreme examples. If all of Frax's bribing on the Vodium and stuff is directed purely into the Frax ETH pool, Frax ETH slash ETH pool, then the <laughs> yield on that thing is going to be super wild. People are going to want to, you know, lock up the ETH to kind of uh, feed off of that. But as they lock up the ETH, Obviously, the rewards are going to be redistributed to the S Frax ETH, and in a perfect efficient market, it should kind of meet each other and increase to a point where they're kind of the same, right? And where that equilibrium is, like you said, it's going to be much higher than where the native um, value. Where the native base, like I'm much better yeah. off just like having it in S Frax ETH, where I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna get an elevated yield than me like running it at home or like and trying ha to like figure out like how to run a validator and like make sure I don't get slashed and all that stuff or Indeed. like yeah 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 I, I say I, I can smell the frax ETH AMO already coming where, that moves the ETH between the frax ETH ETH and into the S frax ETH as the yield is like working out yeah I want to actually get into that point more about like an AMO because like Jack me and you discussed this before you kind of view like 
the Fraxith Mincer as an AMO. So can you um, go into that a bit in like the design of Fraxith? Uh, yeah. Uh, before I do, I just want to kind of, I guess, repeat on the last point. Um, I guess reiterate some of the things that we said mm -hmm. where, you know, we kind of have this uh, uh, echoing what you're saying. <laughs> uh, it's this beautiful system where uh you're right it's like behind the scenes all this is generating yield all this is you know everything is is staked and we have this kind of stable coin that we need for most of the things that we're doing like deep liquidity and kind of you know other stable coin stuff and uh by having all those normal stable coin functions which we're really good at we are increasing the yield of our uh staking derivative and it's kind of beautiful it's like imagine if all of the we ETH or all the ETH that was locked in the WEATH contract, which is a ton. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it's like huge was all generating yield behind the scenes and kind of this, you know, wrapped ETH token that's being used all across DeFi behind the scenes is not only securing the network, but generating massive yield. Uh, so, I don't know, it'd be incredible. <laughs> you and redistributing all of that to the people who are using uh, WEATH. I don't know. I, I I agree. I think, or I mean, obviously I agree, but I, I think yeah. is if you put with to work, yeah, Ooh, we're securing like the that. network and work, bringing you yield. Oh yeah. Oh, that's such a good meme. Weth is lazy. Frax is works. Frax <laughs> yeah. The, the Chad Frax ETH versus the version Weth. Uh, I'm getting so many ideas now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but to answer your question on the, uh, ammo part. Um, so the kind of overall design for the uh, Fraxy, you know, stack is three parts. There's the Fraxy token, which we talked about. There's S Fraxy we talked about, and then the third part is the Fraxy Minter, um, which is, as you said, functions very much like an ammo. Uh, you know, we've said a couple times that. Uh, East staking derivatives are really just stable coins. And I think this is kind of part of where you really see this. Um, and so I'll kind of get into it. But our Frax ETH token is literally just a fork of, you know, our Frax.Sol or our FPI.Sol or any of our other, you know, stable coin tokens. It's literally like, like the contract is a stable coin. Um, and the kind of validator system functions just like an AMO where um, we, you, uh, we, we in fact use the same, you know, kind of backend for it or the same like structure in the contracts to, to do it is you have a, uh, array of kind of like, uh, permissioned minters of the stable coin token and under certain conditions, they're able to, you know, mint, uh, the stable coin supply and we have that set up for a actual, you know, the system that actually mints uh, Frax ETH. So what you'll do is you'll send your ETH to the Frax ETH minter. Um, and just like WEATH, where, you know, if you send it, the receive function in the WEATH contract just sends you back the, the ERC-20 token. Um, it functions just the same way on from the you know, user's perspective. But from the uh, kind of Frax protocol perspective, it functions the exact same way as a, a momenter. Um, which is kind of interesting. That means that we can, that means it's modular, you know, we're able to have uh, in the future, you know, more AMOs. I don't know exactly what they would be used for, but I'm sure we'll eventually come up with something. Uh, that means it is uh, upgradable, but not in a insecure way. I have a problem with like, you know, proxy upgradability to uh, contracts where uh, you are able to, you know, upgrade the actual contract itself and kind of replace what's at that address. Um, if you guys are familiar with like proxies, uh, generally results in a lot of hacks because you're basically just allowing the entire functionality of the contract to be switched arbitrarily. Um, uh, so instead you have this much more secure system where you're able to spin up a new kind of AMO and deprecate the old one and then give the rights to the new one and all these different things. So it's, it's a, all this whole product is basically a re reiteration of what we've already built and, uh, that means that it's done very well, I think, because um, I think our, our stablecoin system is very robust and um, we've done a really good job with it. And we're basically reiterating all that through uh, to a uh, staking derivative. And 
you know, again, that spins us all back to the point where ultimately these things are all just stable coins. And it's I all think, stable coins. Yeah, a lot of time I get asked, it's like, why is Strax building an ETH staking derivative? It's like, well, you don't you don't realize it's a it's a stable coin yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like that meme of the astronaut looking at Earth, like, wait, it's all stable coins, it's like always <laughs> has been. And what's yeah. cool, and what's cool about Frax E, then you're talking about AMOs and AMOs that you can have in the future is like just as you have liquidity AMOs, lending AMOs, um, investor, well, actually, Frax E, the S Frax E, this quote unquote the investor AMO anyway. Like you can have the same stablecoin AMOs uh, for Frax, you can have for Frax E. So in the future, like a lending AMO on Frax Lend, and you can do some real. Like there's so many interesting things you can do, especially if you consider term sheet lending. Like imagine if the terms of the lending pair is that the yield from S Frax ETH goes and automatically pays back the loan. And you don't have to do anything. You just like there's just instructions. You click set and forget and boom, you can actually like not only like attract a so not only can you attract like a bunch of Frax uh, ETH validators just through your yields alone, you can attract them by financing the yields through this credit system. And so you really just built like a whole credit system to finance a bunch of validations and finance essentially the sec securing the ETH network, which is really something unique. Because I don't think any, uh, any other protocol can like do that and have such an insular system to do that. Like maybe they can go to like Aave and do it. Maybe they can go to like make a CDP on like MakerDAO or who knows whatnot. But like no one has like that efficient closed loop the way that like Frax is. Frax is very tight in that. Mm hundred -hmm. percent. So I, I want to double click into the AMO a bit more. And you know how currently right now with the curve AMO, when there's an imbalance of USDC or, or whatever stable coin, you would mint Frax kind of against that, right? And would that theoretically also be how the Frax ETH, ETH pool operate? When there's an imbalance of ETH, there will be Frax ETH minted or? It could be. Um, I haven't personally thought about this too much, so I, I don't necessarily want to speak on it too much. Um, it could. I, I would have to think more about whether or not that, or how, how beneficial is that system? Because there is some differences in, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Frax ETH versus uh, Frax in terms of our collateralization and kind of the way that it functions fundamentally. Because you know, at, at, at a basic layer, you know, the, uh, the Frax, Frax is a, is a hard peg where, you know, we have the assets that back the, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the stable coin. And it's always like, you're always able to withdraw your Frax for the underlying collateral. Um, but at least for right now and for the immediate future, cause it's, it's very unclear when withdrawals will be made live. Uh, we don't actually know, uh, or we won't actually be able to withdraw the collateral. The collateral in this case is locked in validators for an indeterminate amount of time. So, um, getting into things where we start, you know, playing with it on the, I guess like app layer or like above the collateral, it starts becoming a little more complicated because, uh, we aren't able to guarantee that, you know, you are able to at any time withdraw your asset, um, at least until withdrawals are made live. And so until then, uh, or for the immediate future, Frax ETH is a, is a softer peg, you know, um, there are, uh, possible scenarios where like you see with Steeth very often, you know, they start, they, they lose the one-to-one -one peg a little bit. Maybe if there's something happening in the market where you really, really don't want to have your ETH locked up or, or anything else like that. Got it. So. What's the roadmap for Frax ETH? So um, you guys are releasing eminently, I heard. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, what's your plan? I guess, you know, uh, what's your plan to get the word out there, to increase adoption of it? I guess like getting on this podcast is obviously one way, but what are some ways you're thinking of like getting the word out about Frax ETH? Mm -hmm. uh, also, not very much my, my expertise. <laughs> I'm mostly just building it. Uh, but I would say, uh, I think, I think generally we do a good job of attracting people kind of organically to Frax. Um, you know, we've never had like shills. We've never had, um, or we've, I'm sure we do have shills, but they're not. You only have the true believers. 
<laughs> yeah, it's always like, you know, we're organically attracting uh, true believers who really believe in the product and aren't, you know, people who are kind of, uh, you know, bought. We're not buying any friends. Uh, and only so bribing then. <laughs> only bribing <laughs> then. <laughs> not buying, only bribing. <laughs> it's guys. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, and you know, I think I think a lot of people will just kind of look at the state of the uh, you know stake and derivative landscape and be like, I could I could go with X Y Z, and you'll look at Frax ETH, and it's going to have higher yield and all these other things, and I think it'll be kind of a obvious choice, hopefully. Yeah, I, I guess, where do you see the staking derivative landscape going in the next few months? Do you think more protocols are going to be like, oh shit, we need to get like get on this race too? We need to like stake our flag on the consensus layer like all these other protocols have uh probably and i i hope so you know it's very much in the interest of the uh ethereum network to have as many of these staking protocols as 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 we can uh and have as many individual stakers as we can you know everyone needs to be securing the network if someone uh i think it was i apologize if i get it wrong but i think it was super fizz on the Ethereum uh, merge uh, live stream said a good quote that was like, you know, if we want this network to be a nation state level, like settlement layer or nation state level kind of network or, or whatever, and have that level of security, then it needs to have that level of security and it needs that level of like uh, distribution. You know, we need this thing to be invincible. And, yeah. and so I hope more people come and try to enter the, uh, the East staking derivative game. Um, Bring it on, you're saying. The more <laughs> the more and, the merrier, because it's yeah. good for the network, that mm -hmm. kind of diversity. And, yeah, and we want to be supportive of all those people. I mean, whether that's through a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a Fraxy base pool or, or anything else, I think, you know, we want to work with all these people. And um, yeah. what are some ways that, like, frac like how, like, the ETH, like, kind of staking works, like how it, you know, Akira's profit. So it's like obviously from securing the chain. I assume there's going to be some MEV in there. Like, what? Like, what are the ways? How does like each staking earn profit for like as Frax ETH? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there's uh, there are a number of main revenue sources. There's like the staking yield itself, which is locked in uh, the validator until withdrawals are active. So uh, that one you don't have media access to. And then there are also tips and MEV, which are separate and you can specify an address where that gets sent to, where that gets sent to. And that is not locked uh, until withdrawals are active. So that is a little bit more flexible. Um, and uh, we have uh, maximized how um, all these things we're, we're still waiting. We actually have been running as, you know, kind of practice and making sure that we were doing this off our, our own in-house validators have been, uh, you know, running mainnet ETH staking nodes for, uh, since like, you know, like early this summer, I want to say, and, uh, they've been operating very well. We've been kind of in like the top 1%, I think of like, uh, you know, value to yield or, or I forget, there's some metric that I'm, I'm not as familiar with this part, so I, I am botching it, but, uh, there's a metric, I think it's like a connectivity metric or something like that, but our, our, our nodes have performed very well. And, uh, then we will also definitely maximize things through, uh, running MEV boost alongside our validators. Um, we haven't activated those yet because. Uh, we want to make sure that all the different hiccups are worked out before we kind of put that live. Um, but uh, because right now with like proposed builder separation, all these new things that are trying, it's like, uh, especially with kind of the state of builders that might not be um, super competitive. We want to make sure this whole kind of MEV boost ecosystem gets more robust before we incorporate it on our own. But definitely something that we're going to be running like very, very, very quickly. Um, uh, cause I think that on its own, I think the MEV in addition to, uh, staking yield boost will end up boosting staking yield significantly. Um, another then, boost. What's, what's that? I said another boost, another boost. Yeah. We've got the, the staking yield, the MEV, the tips, the, uh, the, and then all of our DeFi things, all of our like curve purple, convex all and all that stuff. Incentives. And Jack, um, what are the fees being charged? 
um, to kind of provide all the service. Like Lido charges 10%, I believe, and that is split mm -hmm. amongst the node runners and up 10 percent to the DAO. Oh, geez, that's a lot. Yeah. I, I'm not yeah. sure if they updated it or not, but that was what I last saw. Last I saw, there it was 5% to the people running the operators mm -hmm. and 5% to the Lido DAO, which is, yep. which is a lot. Um, we, we plan on taking a very, very small, um, we're, we're more concerned with like, or, you know, and a lot of, a lot of what we want to do with the project is kind of like economies of scale and kind of like making this larger. Like if we want to actually have a curve pool that we can have deep liquidity with and, and have other pools pair against, you know, we need to get Fraxy to the size where it actually makes sense to do that. Um, so, uh, I don't know, I guess this isn't the main reason how we'd go about doing that, but you know, part of being a, uh, good staking derivative is, and attracting the most users is it's a, it's a game of inches. You know, if you're offering, you know, just 1% higher yield than another staking derivative, then it makes sense that you're going to choose that one. Uh, or the, you know, and, uh, so, so minimizing all those, you know, different fees and any sort of friction is, is important. You know, there might be other staking derivatives that don't give you any of the MEV or maybe that's how they, um, you know, cause that's what they're taking for themselves or. Um, you don't give you any tips or, or, or whatever, or take your, you know, 10% cut or whatever it is. Uh, we want to minimize that as much as possible and just kind of focus on maximizing yield. So yeah, for the people. So, so you guys haven't decided on a, a certain percent yet, or would that be more like dynamic? Um, I, I think it'll be, um, we have not finalized a number. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I had to make an estimate, it would probably be like um instead of 10 percent on the whole thing it would be like 10 percent on just the mev or something like that um wow. so mm -hmm. which so that would probably end up being like less than five percent or you know somewhere like two three mm -hmm. got it and and how would you incentivize the node runners then or do you think that frax is going to be running all the nodes that's probably not very decentralized <laughs> mm -hmm. or like so, what's the plan for the nodes and stuff yeah node yeah, runners yeah. So out of on, on launch, we will be running these things ourselves. Um, uh, we kind of to and while we're uh, not setting everything's up because everything is set up, but um, you know, out of the box, uh, we want these things to be kind of under our own control. And, and that's going to be our model for the beginning. Um, but we have a roadmap of opening uh, a more decentralized node operator system. Uh, the kind of main design idea right now is just like with rocket pool where you have someone provides, you know, there's 16 ETH um, and then you're able to pool with a bunch of other people we could, and you can think of that, uh, or sorry, they give 16 ETH, they're able to pool their ETH with a bunch of other people's. And then that the person with the 16 ETH runs that validator. Um, we would have a similar system where, uh, you know, you provide us X amount of ETH, uh, the number probably being four ETH, um, because a validator can only get slashed for up to four ETH, I believe. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to overcloud us too much over that. And I think Rockpool is actually considering changing from 16 to four is because, you know, it is inefficient. Um, and we would be leveraging, ultimately you can think of the system of, you know, I give you X amount and then that gives me the rights to, uh, use or to run the node, you can think of it like you're collateralizing your, your node running, right? Um, your 16 ETH or four ETH or whatever is the collateral and, uh, that you're you know giving in order to run the node. And, uh, uh, we would, so since this is collateral, this is kind of a, you know, uh, Frax lend system, if you will. And so we'll probably end up you, uh, leveraging Ooh. our Frax lend tech in order to, you know, provide this system and provide this decentralized operating mechanism. Okay, so someone will put up a bond on Fraxland for the right to run a node. So they could put up like four ETH and then they get the right to run it and then they get more ETH from other people in the system. And then boom, you have a Frax ETH validator. Exactly. Um, and there's also a thing that I really want to hammer on is that there is also an inherent limitation of ETH staking derivatives. And that is that, uh, you know, the EVM has no way to query the, the beacon chain. Um, meaning, you know, if you have a smart contract that is your staking derivative, uh, that has no way of knowing that your, uh, your validator has made X amount of yield or has been slashed or any of these things. Right. Um, 
<clears throat> there's no way that your smart contract knows uh, you know, what's happened to your validators. Uh, and so with any ETH staking derivative, you have this inherent problem of uh, you're, you have to trust, there has to be some trust assumption. Either you're trusting some Oracle, which has its own kind of like system, or you have a, you know, a DAO that you're kind of whatever, or you've got a team that's running it. And so um, ultimately, even now with our uh, you know, there, there is a, there's a limitation on ETH staking derivatives. Well, they'll never be able to be 100% decentralized and kind of autonomous in like a smart contract sense, uh, because necessarily there needs to be some sort of reliance on something which will allow this communication. And so I don't know if eventually that's something that'll be added to Ethereum or, you know, what kind of solutions there are, but, um, with every staking derivative right now on the market, you are making some, there is some sort of trust assumption of you know, who am I trusting to, uh, you know, tell me how much yield there's been or that hasn't been slashed or in so any So this sort of makes each staking kind of the equivalent to real world assets because like you said, you can't, it's the information doesn't exist on the blockchain. It exists outside of it and there's no way to access it. The only way to access it is with some trusted party, whether it's like a validator or like whoever was running it or something else. Yeah, I think that's a, uh... That's an interesting, yeah, I think, I think that analogy makes sense. It's like they're, 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 you know, you would assume it being, you know, Ethereum and we're all building things on Ethereum that you should be able to, you know, kind of get these numbers and, you know, query these things from your smart contract, but uh, it's actually not that way. And, um, yeah. Wow. I didn't even realize that before. That's, that's interesting. Cause that's, that's, that's something like all you know, liquid staking derivatives face as a problem. And, you know, whether, I wonder if Frax can like create a smart contract of like all people who do sign up to be, you know, Frax ETH validators. And then from there on, they can like track their performance, right? Uh, you mean like a, like tracking people who, who like, uh, are, who are like part of the Frax ETH validator system. Let's say I want to run a node, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you guys like quote unquote like whitelist me and then I get to run a node and because I'm in the Fraxied system, you, there's, you guys may like deploy a smart contract or something that can track my performance. Yeah, that's, that's the, the issue though, is that the smart contract that we deploy that's meant to, you know, track oh, your performance won't, won't be able to. There's oh, it's impossible. It's like a fun, yeah. it's like a core problem. When, mm, yeah. Yeah, so well, there, there needs an oracle. Okay. So, you know, Jack, let us know when you release uh, Frax Link oracles in the next three months. I guess, like, <laughs> yeah. so, like, what's, like, a way to, like, fix this problem? Is there, could, could like, the Ethereum blockchain, like, release some, like, new EIP standard that keeps track of validator performance or something? Is that possible? I, 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 they might. I, I'm not entirely sure i think there it might be possible that there's a you know an ethereum update that allows that um but yeah yeah so I, i'm not i'm not sure from the you know from the ethereum mm -hmm. standpoint but um any solution to that needs to be kind of you know it has the inherent like oracle problem i i, I don't really know what it looks like from a solving that in like a blockchain level like you know yeah. what, something the evm or whatever i'm I assume if it becomes big enough a problem, which I think it could be, considering the you know dominance of staking derivatives, then uh, maybe it's something that they'd consider adding. And I, don't, and I don't even know about the viability of adding that. There might be more technical uh, limitations to be able to add that that I'm not even considering. Frax link soon, TM. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess like I, I remember at Gelato, they actually just came up with something. Um, like you can take like off chain information and bring it on chain to like do certain automation tasks. So like the best example is like if Elon tweets about Doge, you can mm. just like program it to like buy like wrap Doge on chain. I wonder if there's like some use case for that where like you can like see if there's you can input in some program um, like, oh, like this person got slashed and then like bring that quote unquote off chain data on chain. Um, I don't, I'm just like spinning ideas from my, my, my former life as a uh, gelato growth person. <laughs> Jack, I, I, I want to um, circle back to earlier. You said that you guys are going to first roll out by running your own validators. 
would you guys have any capacity issues? Are you thinking of like capping the quantity of Frax ETH initially? What's the rollout plan there? Uh, there shouldn't be. Um, we have a kind of distributed cloud service set up where it scales automatically with the size of, uh, you know, this, this whole thing is, is designed so that um, as soon as smart contracts are deployed um, and we've loaded the, the, let me, let me go back a couple steps. Uh, the Fraxeth Minter contract, which I touched on briefly earlier, is filled with kind of as many validators as we have ready. Um, so we can generate, you know, 10,000 validators uh, with the, there's the Ethereum deposit CLI uh, and load those into the operator registry and load those into our kind of our uh, um, validator operation uh, system or, you know, our backend, if you will. And uh, they will, it, it's all set up to automatically scale as people deposit into the Fraxeth Minter. So if you, every time that the Fraxeth Minter gets 32 ETH, it pops, you know, one of our fresh validators that has not been loaded up yet um, from that stack, pairs it with that, sends it to the ETH deposit contract and automatically on our back end spins up a uh, validator, which since these are, you know, we're not <laughs> running on this on like some servers are like our own, like, I don't know, someone doesn't have like a Raspberry Pi set up somewhere that's just like running the... <laughs> <laughs> the All the Frax validators are on like a, a, a thousand Raspberry Pi, pe like Pies in like some yeah. warehouse somewhere. Fraxberry <laughs> Pi. Fraxberry Pi. <laughs> Fraxberry. Uh, okay. Straight out of the oven. Validators yeah. coming out by the dozen. I, I, I had thought that like um for Steth, there was this thing where as more people mint Steth, it takes time for the Lido team and all the node runners to take all that ETH and kind of run nodes and start generating rewards. So the uh, later Steth depositor or, or ETH depositors into Steth actually reaps the benefit of the earlier uh, Steth holders because you know their ETH has been deployed and putting into work, whereas the new Steth holders ETH is still kind of in the queue. Does, does that yeah. problem not exist with Frax ETH? Mm, I, I think I understand. I think, uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what problem that would be referring to, but there isn't a, as soon as there's, I guess, I, I guess technically we have that problem, but only under like 32 ETH, which is, you know, with given the size of the, mm. uh, like, like the queue is only 32 ETH. Uh, big, right? So, you know, that becomes a, a rounding error and very, very insignificant compared to the amount um, that we expect to be running. And shouldn't the yields, like, offset that problem from, like, both, like, s ETH and the curve yeah. pools and whatever else? So, like, I don't think it's as much as a problem as... Thought. For sure, but it's also that um, since this is all happening automatically, you know, there isn't much of a uh, manual aspect. Um, the only kind of uh, and, and so, so there shouldn't be very much, if any, of a problem with you know, kind of your early depositor gets the gets you know, diluted per se. But, but Dave, do, do you know what I'm talking about? I I saw this thread. Um, it was a while back, but someone mm -hmm. had pointed that out with, with regards to Steph, that mm -hmm. like there was a a lag time between uh, the lead time between your ETH being deposited mm -hmm. into. Lido with it actually mm -hmm. being uh, launched on the node runner. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm not, I'm not familiar with it actually, it. but um, I guess yeah, the way I it, it sounds good. It sounds yeah. good that we don't have that problem. <laughs> Hell yeah. I, I also say the way that our, uh, the, I, that, that also, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a problem with the kind of like, I don't know, like steep design itself. Whereas, uh, I, I don't know. The, the contract we're using for SFAX ETH might also mitigate yeah. that possibly. I don't know. Honestly, like that, problem I like, was, yeah, I saw on like Frax Fax, um, mm -hmm. like you guys basically have a bunch of ETH validators, like, like they're uninitialized and like they're basically ready to go to like receive the ETH and start securing the chain. And so I don't foresee Frax having that problem unless all of those uninitialized validators are filled. Right. It's very much a, a, the, the limiting factor is, you know, as long as those validators are there, they're, you know, ready to go and spin up, a, you know, as soon as the Fraxeth Mentor gets 32 ETH. Um, I, we, we, you know, and so it's very easy to predict, like, 
you know, if we're about to have a, like a problem, like you'll, you'll see it like ahead of time, like yeah. oh, only a hundred mm -hmm. validators left or something like that. Um, and so it's so very easy to, you know, uh, spin those up ahead of time. Cool. Yeah, and, and we plan on just like swamping that with a ton of just a crap ton of validators. Cause it's like, you know, we want to be able to accept if you want to deposit, you know, 10,000 ETH at a time, whatever, like you should, it should be able to handle that. Yeah, it sounds like Frax ETH has really positioned itself to really be an ETH black hole between like all the different opportunities for yield in terms of ease of use, like literally like send it in, stake. Um, like, like what, I'm still like, I'm so, I, I feel like this is like the silver bullet for Frax. This is like what we've been waiting for, like, which is really ironic because like we built a stable coin system, but now like we've like have this like new stable coin with, that's pegged to ETH. And all this infrastructure we built can be used to like direct rewards, both like emissions from like you know curve and convex or like organic yield from the beacon chain to this system. Um, I'm like I'm I'm still like I, I'm really wondering what like the expected yields could be from this, like because right now I, I haven't checked what it is for like Steeth or like Rocket Pool. I know Rocket Pool said they'll do emissions soon. Um, I wonder like with all the voting power like that Fraxeth has, and actually I'm not sure if you guys saw, but Oros Bros did like a thread yesterday about like how Lido like is actually oh, unprofitable yeah. with their emissions yeah. and like that actually they should start like, you know, accumulating convex to have voting power and like kind of like we're kind of seeing like the next what the next few months is going to look like. And I'm, I'm like wondering like what the Lido guys are thinking. And I'm wondering like with this like stronghold, like what these yields could be. I wonder if they could be like 75 percent or something like that with the amount of like convex or CRV that Frax the protocol has. Yeah, you, you think we're gonna get a um, run it back turbo situation with the whole curve wars, except this time, like, e yeah, edition? I do. <laughs> yeah, no, I think like, it's pretty clear, like where the uh, winds are heading, like, as yields dry up on it, it's funny, like, we have this like real yield narrative. It's like, we kind of like, we start off with like DeFi summer where it was just like, you know, like, Ponzi's everywhere in the sense of like, oh, like just like putting this like yield farm, like that's an exchange. And then like the whole like yield, that yield race went to like, instead of like exchanges and AMMs, they went to like the chains themselves. So like you had like the L1s and sensors and stuff. And then you have like own forks and then you had like different variations of that. And then like once like, you know, up only stopped and it went to like down bad, um, you had this like narrative towards real yield. And like you have like different protocols and different, um, you know, strategies that are doing stuff on chain. Like you see like Umami with the Delta Neutral Vaults. You see like GMX with like the fees from their exchange. But what is the realest yield than the yield that's from the chain itself? From like, like literally like the defense of the chain and the security of the chain. That is the realest yield that, that they're homegrown. straight from. Homegrown, straight from the source. And mm -hmm. you know, there's not like, there's only like five, ETH, I guess four or five like known players out there there's like rocket pool lido coinbase uh maybe like stake wise and whatnot but like now frax ETH is about to like enter the game with like you know with pretty powerful like weapons at his disposals and like that's what really gets me amped up about it um because i was like thinking like where where else can like frax get yield like we've like conquered like the curve landscape but like where where else is out there other than and like this is kind of a good in between between like real world assets when that stuff gets figured out and like the stuff happening on chain, like the consensus like layer. And I'm sure like because of like the Oracle problem that's inherent that you mentioned, um, like things will get figured out that will be applied to other real world assets in the future. End rant. <laughs> I, I could totally see this, this button, Jack, which says farm to stables. And you just click it and it literally just turn all your ETH yield into frack stables and you can just farm frack stables and just literally, you know, live yeah. on the interest from the ETH yield at a uh, period. Pretty cool. I, I think um, also, uh, I, I guess to kind of bring back a, a previous point, um, we were talking about uh, you know how this is the uh, maybe some silver bullet or some some last piece of something in the in the frax industry and I, I think that's a uh, or ecosystem <laughs> I keep saying industry which is kind of funny the frax industry <laughs> but um, 
uh, really here, I mean, what we've been doing is we've, we've, we've built this Trinity and we're trying to, you know, now we're building Fox ETH and we're building other things and it, we're really trying to capture, you know, the entire industry. This time I do mean industry where, you know, we're trying to be Frax, the kind of all in one, uh, you know, one stop shop for kind of all of DeFi and kind of, uh, be, you know, one of the, the best, uh, you know, players across all space and all facets of DeFi. Right. And um, the ultimate form of that is, you know, Ethereum itself, where mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, you know, all of these things are, you know, being ran on Ethereum. And by having Frax ETH, we are now uh, not only securing, you know, the network, you know, kind of the mycelium that we're running on, but also we are, uh, you know, taking ownership of it. We are, you know, helping run it. We are, you know, a fundamental part of the, you know, actual thing that we're built on top of. And, you know, with our long-term vision being kind of, uh, you know, do all of all of this stuff, kind of control the entire stack uh, or eventually have like, you know, be it Frax Chain, you know, some sort of like oh, oh. one-stop shop. Another have. one. Be careful. Who <laughs> 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 knows no end. <laughs> But, you know, this is kind of all on the roadmap to get there. It's like, you know, in order for Frax to be, you know, everything uh, we need, a uh, we need, we need Frax ETH. Yeah. Uh, and think... since so much of Frax is kind of built on, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, I guess to circle back to yield one more time. Uh, it's like, you know, ETH staking yield is, is, is real yield, you know, it's, or it's the I mean, realest. I mean, Oh, yeah. it's, it's like you know it's yield based on providing like a, a service and you know you brought up real world assets and things but it's like you know we're outside of you know DeFi. we are providing a, like a service and, and yeah like synonymous or not synonymous but analogous to a to a real world asset and so yeah. it is cool and it you know ties very much in with our, our mission of kind of to have this entire stack under one roof yeah and like with stake you know with the whole staking eth uh, play here. It's like you are getting paid to provide security, to provide defense, like defense of a nation, like defense of the chain. Like think about like the military industrial complex. That is the big one of the biggest parts of America's GDP is that alone. And so like that is kind of the equivalent of like what all these ETH validators are doing. And um, reciprocally, um, you can always depend on like the ETH to pay you out the yield. It's like with a real world asset, let's say you do it on like housing or like whatever else, like that isn't like guaranteed to come back to you. Like what if like the person or company defaults or like what if something else happens like that you just can't predict, you know, there's like layers of custody and like and whatnot. With like each staking, it's like programmed that it's going to give those who secure the chain yield. And so it's like the most logical first step uh, in this. Yeah, and I, I guess to repeat myself one more time, it's like we're trying to take this entire suite of you know Ethereum products under one umbrella, and at the same time we are you know starting to gain ownership of Ethereum itself. So it's like uh, whether the goal is to control all parts of the DeFi stack slash outside of DeFi or Frax Chain, you know Frax ETH allows us to really it's like it's like why not yeah. both? We are building Frax Chain. Ethereum <laughs> and we are, you know, taking everything under one umbrella by, you know, having the Trinity and having Frax ETH and all these things. Yeah. So, so, so what you just pre presented right there, Jack, would be like what success looks like for, for this Frax. whole, for Frax and Frax ETH, right? So I, I want to challenge you to think on the other side as well as like, what does failure look like? Like, w what are some challenges that you are, you know, that keeps you up at night? <laughs> uh, Let's see. <laughs> um, You're conjuring nightmares. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, you know, obviously we're building something really, really large here, <laughs> like something with a, a lot of potential and a lot of uh, uh, whatever. And, and you know, it's really important that we do it right. You know, we have a responsibility to Ethereum that we don't lead this down like the the wrong path and you know the responsibility to just kind of the whole industry it's like we are in a like I mean you look at uh, like you look at examples like um, like Terra which you know collapses and then brings all sorts of 
problems to kind of the industry where, you know, all sorts of negative externalities to their collapse, you know, and it's like that kind of, you know, it's very real where it's like, you know, failure, you know, cannot really be an option because we, it would be, it would not only take us down, but, you know, a lot of other people down with us. And yeah. And, and we're, st we're still feeling, you know, this ripple effects of the lunar collapse even months later in like the mm -hmm. form of like regulation talk and this and that. So I like definitely know what you mean. And you know, I feel like Frax sees itself as a diplomat of DeFi. And you should just say it at the stablecoin level. But now since it's entering like the whole eat staking game, it's also mm -hmm. at like the consensus level at like literally the blockchain level, literally advocating for the chain itself. Mm -hmm. So with great power comes great responsibility. And I don't think there's a better team out there to, you know, take, you know, to be placed with that responsibility than the Frax team and the Frax community. And, and as part of that, um, you know, it really shouldn't just be, you know, it's inherently flawed to, to just trust us, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this should be uh, something that you, you know, you're trusting our entire community and you're having whatever. So, so kind of alongside all these things, one of the things that probably the Frax team hasn't talked too much about is we're completely revamping our like, our, our, our governance structure. Ooh, definitely and, want to uh, go into that and see about it. Yeah, we're uh, going to be increasing a you know community reliance. Every single you know transaction that we propose as kind of like the team from the MSIG, um, will you know the you can imagine everything needs to be ran past uh, the community with through like a like a time lock where all of our transactions need to be executed. Uh, this is all still kind of like work in progress, but it's coming very soon um, where, and you know, we don't want to rush it because, you know, like I said, uh, doing this correctly is really important, but yeah. the general idea being that um, all of our proposed transactions, all of our MSIG transactions after, as we, you know, do it internally as a team, it needs to be, you know, signed off on by the community through a um, kind of, you know, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say necessarily Governor Bravo, because there's also some alternatives that we're looking at, whatever. But, uh, and, and then additionally that this, we want this whole system to be able to function uh, even without the MSIG, you know, the, the, we want the community to be kind of the majority vote on all these things. And that, you know, if something were to happen to, you know, the MSIG or, uh, you know, or the team or whatever, this entire system needs to be completely autonomous if it, if it, uh, you know, in that case, uh, yeah. So well, we are currently in the process of of uh, revamping that system, where you know the community is the the majority say in all these things, and has ultimately, uh, you know, we're just proposing things to them. Yeah. Uh, and and you know that's, uh, I, I think that's going to be really incredible because it's like you know now that we have all these different parts of this, you know, DeFi stack, this whole industry, whatever. Uh, in the spirit of, you know, crypto, all these things should be controlled by the community. And that's, that's where it will be very, very soon. Um, Give it so back yeah. to the community more than a meme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think it's important for Frax to decentralize over time. And it's like important for us to have like a roadmap too. But I wonder like what parts of it will be like decentralized. Like there's some things that definitely like should be decentralized if they aren't already, but there are other things like you know, active management has like saved millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. I mean, you look at all the bridge hacks recently, like, you know, and you look at like other exploits, whether it's a Rory exploit or something else, like Frax was able to get money out because mm. it had like the multi six. So it's like definitely this balance and definitely recognizing that, you know, like, hey, we're still in like beta in D5. We're still in this minefield. We got to be careful. But at the same time, like lower like centralization risk and like decentralized. Mm. It's like it's a very delicate tightrope to walk and like certain events definitely like signify like, oh, it's time to decentralize more whether it's tornado cash. But then there's also events that like, oh wait, we shouldn't like go like decentralize super everything. Otherwise you end up with like a situation like Bean or like whatever happened to Compound like a year ago. Like it's a very delicate balance and people just like to jump on narratives and jump on mobs because it's like easy. Cause like, oh, like decentralize everything. But like, you know, at the end of the day, like when people's like funds are like at stake no pun intended, at stake here, you need to be like really smart in how you move, really thoughtful and really, in a sense, slow and make sure that, you know, you already know, just do it right. If you're going to do something, do it right. Absolutely. 
And and you're right that you know having uh, you know we've been able to act very quickly um, as the multisig, and that that has saved us like millions and millions of dollars in hacks. You know we are up pretty much 24 seven. We'd be able to react to these things immediately, and that has yeah. You guys literally were up before Nomad. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. that team. Like, that, that, if that doesn't tell you that like these guys are up 24 7 i don't know what will i don't know what will and there's only eight of them there's only eight of them <laughs> and that's but, why we need to centralize too because there's only eight of them but there's been um yeah i mean we, we've been able to act very quickly and that has been very very much to our benefit i feel like we've probably been maybe disproportionately criticized for that when it's like well if you actually look at the numbers it's like we have done a huge service to the protocol by being able to move quickly yeah um, and so our you know kind of proposed design will will strike a very good balance i think between allowing us to still move quickly and innovate and, and be able to react to things uh but also uh make sure that ultimate control is is given to the community and that ultimately they have say in everything so uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about the design, and uh, hopefully, hopefully that's. I, I, I uh, don't have much more to say on it, but hopefully, there's more to be said very, very soon. Yeah. Um, now, I, I kind of want to like get a little bit more like bigger picture outside of like Frax and Ethan, more just like the Frax protocol um, hmm. itself. Like, as a dev that's been working with Frax for a year, what do you think? Like, over like the past, t you know, ten years, you've been working on it. Um, what has like Frax biggest strengths have been and what do you think like what things like Frax protocol needs to work on? Um, biggest strengths and things to work on. Man, I didn't prepare for this. <laughs> uh, this is I the think... improv section. This is when like my mind goes <laughs> off to ask random questions. You have entered the second hour of the flywheel pod. This is where we get like into just like the chill conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, let's see. Biggest strengths. I think. I think I think you said it yourself earlier. It's like we've done an excellent job of you know skating where the puck is going. Um, I think time and time again we've seen uh, we've seen kind of uh, decisions that we've made been proven to be kind of the right way to do things or or like um, I don't know. We, we're just very quick to make decisions. That I think are, are end up being very much the right one. Like I think uh, I don't want to pick on. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of examples, but. Um, like I, I think having like, you know, I think of like frack swap with, uh, with like, you know, TWAMs, you know, uh, like that's a huge innovation that I think revolutionizes like DeFi really. I think that's a, probably the biggest, uh, upgrade to any sort of like XYK or, you know, any sort of, um, whatever liquidity pool since like, uh since maybe Uniswap V3 or even Uniswap V2, like, I don't know, I, I think that's a massive, massive innovation. And like, I think increasingly you're seeing people kind of adopt, uh, you know, TWAP buys or uh, similar things where it's like, we need to move huge size over time and we're gonna do it in, you know, a, over like a, a spread out kind of way. Essentially, you're the seeing DCA a lot- The DCA machine. I call it like the TWAP, the TWAM, the DCA machine. Yeah, yeah, it is a DCA machine. Um, but you're seeing all sorts of protocols kind of adopt these DCA machines. So these, you know, essentially TWAMs. And I, I think like that, that was something that we saw and recognized and like jumped on really quick uh, and has been fantastic. We use it all the time and it will continue to be something and you'll see more and more throughout DeFi. Uh, and I, I think also, you know, with that, you, you know, the basic like Trinity idea, it's like uh, you're seeing all sorts of you're seeing all these uh, you know, lending protocols that have stable coins or your lending protocols that don't have stable coins now announcing stable coins. You're seeing uh, DEXs that don't have stable coins now announcing stable coins. You see all these different kind of like- uh, Everyone wants a stable coin and they all need a base pool to pair to. Mm -hmm. I wonder what and they're gonna like, do. It's all, you know, our, our like, uh, you know, Trinity vision, kind of this like conquering the whole stack kind of vision is, is uh, I, I think ahead of what trends we're seeing, where you're seeing people realize they can gain a lot of value from from having an in-house part of the stack for you know something else, and kind of we've been very rapidly like building all these different things, uh, and they all uh, what's the word synergize with each other, um, and so we have this extremely you know, synergistic ecosystem between all our different parts and it just keeps on getting better with every new like uh, product that we launch. Yeah.
Yeah. And what about uh, things that Frax needs to work on, in your opinion? What are some like Frax weaknesses? Yeah. Uh, things to work on. I think. I think right now we aren't capturing 100% of the value from my innovations. I think I, I still see to this day, like people on Twitter being like, hmm, like has anyone, someone asked me, one of my friends, one of the other Paradigm fellows asked me the, not too long ago, if any, if anyone had ever seen a TWAM like implemented in DeFi. And I was like, come on, bro. Like I talked to you, like, <laughs> you know, this, you know, this, <laughs> or, um, and I would expect, you know, they would have known because they're like, uh, they're a Paradigm fellow and like Paradigm came up with the TWAM, you know? And so if there's one that exists, you should probably know where it is or I, I don't know. Um, that and like, uh, and other things. But I, I think, um, I think it, it's, a, I don't, I don't, it really isn't that big of a weakness, but I think it's something that not frustrates me, but something similar to that where it's like, I, you know, I see people doing all these things that we already do or like trying to ideate on them or trying to come up with how to it's like like i'll see people on twitter uh, chewing up like oh how will we do you know x and i'll be like oh like we we solved that already like like we literally did that we, we literally did. so it's more of just a like a, a short-term awareness problem that all you need to do is like get the word out and go up more and i think like drake has said similar things and i think that's really the place of flywheel pod in the frax ecosystem is getting the word out of all like the dope shit that you guys are doing. Like how like Fraxland, our Fraxland interview was cited in like a bunch of different publications and like really got people excited about it. Um, and I'm sure with this Frax ETH interview, you know, before it was kind of like shrouded in mystery, like, Oh, like what's going on. But as people listen to it, they understand how it's structured, how, how it works, its benefits. Um, I expect the same to do it as well. And it's like always like attention is like, you want to get the right attention. Like not all, like people are like all press is good press. Like, no, some press is like is like toxic. Like if like if you have like people that are like mercenary and just like want to come in and extract as much out of your protocol or whatever, you don't want that attention. You want like people that are long term stakers and like long term holders that actually want to see the systems succeed. Like I call it like long term greed. Like you want like those long term greedy people to be a part of your community. And I think like that is probably the best thing that like Frax has one of the best things Frax has done, but it isn't immediately obvious because nothing long-term is immediately obvious. Yeah. We're, we're very much, you know, we're keeping our heads down. We're building, you know, uh, heads down and build, especially in this part, especially in bears. Mm -hmm. It's the got to survive, you know, yeah. or you can't get, I think our thesis is ultimately we put good tech out and ultimately that kind of becomes, you know, yeah. and naturally everything else comes as a, as a product of that. And so getting caught up and it's like, Oh, like people don't know about, uh, whatever, like, Oh, why isn't, why isn't FXS price mooning <laughs> or whatever? It's like, <laughs> it's focusing on the wrong yeah. thing. Sometimes mm -hmm. the trading chat's just like so funny. I mean, like, cause the people are just like, Oh, like they're, they're, they're just like, everyone's in pain. But like, mm -hmm. the thing is like all assets are down. So like all assets yeah. are in pain. <laughs> Like I, for some reason, like, you know, everybody, the thing is with like, if you're going to like talk about trading, like people like get, and I've done it too, they get attached to their bags, like personally. And they're mm -hmm. just like, they like feel the pain when it like goes down, but they feel the euphoria when it goes up. And like, mm -hmm. that's, that's why like people should always be careful when trading. Cause it's just like such a fucking emotional ride. Yeah. Yeah, Jack. Not in financial I, advice. <laughs> yeah, NFA, <laughs> NFA. And um, thanks, Jack, for the plug, for the flywheel plug there. Uh, we did not pay him beforehand for that. That was purely <laughs> organic. Uh, but, Jack, I, I wanted to ask you, like, aside from Frax ETH, what other projects are you currently building at Frax that's kind of under the hood? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> as a... I was laughing at our, our Frax Oracle, Frax Link plus Frax, Frax Chain plus... <laughs> We're just going to mm -hmm. keep going. Um, like, yeah. The, uh, the, okay. The immediate roadmap is, uh, Frax ETH. Um, and then there's, there's some improvements to, um, uh, other things, which are, uh, like there's, I, I don't know, like there's some like new Frax and Oracles are coming out. There's you know, Frax swap router upgrades, like all the, all these cool things. Um, and then the next major ones are, we have our Frax ferry, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure if people have talked about. No. no, no. Okay. Um, right now there's a lot of, I haven't been kind of working on Frax Ferry, so I, uh, take everything I say with a grain of salt, but, uh, we've had a lot of problem problems with like, with bridges. Um, and you know, 
getting how do you get fracks on other chains or get fracks that are on other chains back to to fracks uh you know back to mainnet um without kind of screwing up the trust assumption um and, or no, sorry without trusting them and then ending up getting hacked for tens of millions of dollars which is what keeps happening uh mm -hmm. and there's kind of an inherent problem here and so we are working on a very simple way to uh, kind of transport fax between chains, which we are calling fax ferry. Um, I'm surprised <laughs> I don't talk about it, but maybe I. <laughs> There's been some like sprinklings in the chat about it. Okay, yeah, good, good. I, I want to make sure I'm not like. I hope I'm not like <laughs> announcing this accidentally. <laughs> it's funny. I was just on a space with Drake, and he said like the same thing about uh like like curve LP uh, tokens mm. being used for like lending. It's like, wait, was I supposed to say that? But it was like somewhere. It was actually somewhere. Like Sam, like said it in the chat. Mm. Like I, I feel like you know. There's actually. No, let, let me fin let you finish the Frax roadmap updates, and then I'll say my piece. Yeah, I mean, I kind of got the gist of it, but uh, th about like instead of trying to come up, come up with a more complicated way, it's like, oh, we're gonna have these like you know proofs and things with all these different Oracle, whatever. Like instead of coming up with like a complicated bridge design, let's. Not even build a bridge. Let's build a like a. Uh, I wanted to call it a airlift, where you're just picking up fracks from one chain, putting it down another chain. And, like there's no bridge aspect, um, but that allows you to have fracks deployed on all these things in a canonical way, uh, and trust that your fracks on a different chain will hold value, and trust that you'll be able to redeem that, and and all these things. And uh, so, but instead of building a more complicated system, we're going to build a dumber system or a more simple system, which is foolproof, you know, literally cannot break because this only does one thing uh, kind of idea. And I think that will end up being a very smart design because, uh, cause just we're seeing bridges go down left and right. You know, we're seeing bridges just get they're so rickety. Yeah. They're, they're quite rickety. Um, so instead we're going back to boat transportation. We're going back uh, to the ferry. It's not a bridge. Oh, it's a ferry. Oh, now I see. Ferry, like uh, Tinkerbell. Yeah, yeah. Right? Sorry, I should have said boat. Like a like drive your car. No, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. Please have a yeah. Frax ferry uh, uh, logo as as the. I wonder icon. what the logo is gonna look like. It might, we it. we have some. <laughs> yeah, um, I was gonna say like how like Frax does like that because like I feel like I heard of this thing like you don't want to like save like a not like big announcements make it all secret it's like more of like you want to like leak them and like get people like excited little by little and just like get them more hungry and get them more hungry and like say like frax ferry but like don't release like all the details about it but then you release you drop a little bit more and a little bit more it's kind of like you're just leaving like bread comes for the people and the dgens like mm -hmm. wanting to like learn more and then i think the coolest part about it is people will go out for themselves and figure out like what's being built and that's what Xerox D24 did with Fraxland. He basically yeah. wrote the whole system before it was announced, or before it was released months later. And then that's what another threader um, did with Frax ETH um, when, that ch when that chart was released, uh, when Travis just like dropped that in the chat. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh, Frax ETH. And then like, he like, basically broke down how like, Frax ETH and S Frax ETH would work. Um, and so like, I like this idea. It's actually like, it, it brings the community and brings like people like involved in the process of like announcing and like makes it more organic. It's like, Oh, like the community is like figuring out like what's going to happen. Like, Oh, like if you want the alpha, just like go figure it out for yourself or like go find the people who figure it out for themselves, which is like pretty yeah. cool. Very organic. Massive respect to those guys too. They're uh, <laughs> soldiers. <laughs> yeah. Soldiers on the, on the field of the chain. <laughs> okay. So, so, so far we have uh, Frax Chain, Frax Link, Frax Ferry. Uh, is there possible, this, you know, Frax Soul, Frax Avax, Frax, insert your favorite Frax POS Cosmos. chain here? I don't see it any Frax Cosmos talk? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Maybe. Not, I guess not like once Frax Ferry is released, then we can like worry about other chains. Yeah, or oh, 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 you meant deploy on Cosmos. I thought deploy on that. Cosmos. Yeah, yeah Frax Cosmos, Frax Adam. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, that face. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that. <laughs> with part of the, you know, with having a ferry, it makes it really easy to spin up Frax on other chains. So that's like a, mm -hmm. that's a, a good uh, benefit. I mean, if there's demand for that, I'm sure that's yeah. that would be easily done. Uh, not, not sure. I haven't, I have not personally thought about it. I'm at curious all. about this, like, Frax, like, Link and Frax, like, Oracle. So, like, all right, Frax, uh, Link, I was just joking about it. That's, that's oh, okay. Not, 
Oh, that's like a show. <laughs> I guess like Oracle's are like a whole nother like stack to build and they're quite, you know, there's all these different parts of the blockchain stack. You have like Oracles, you have bots for automation, you know, you have like other, th it, it's really interesting like how like deep you can go and how granular you can go and like what cool things can be built and like what things like are the benefit of the protocol to like own parts of the stack like Frax does with mm -hmm. the Trinity and like what parts are like worth outsourcing per se. Mm. Yeah, this is true. I mean, we're very much focused on building our own products where we see synergies. Like mm. if, you know, there's, if there's no reason for us to go build something and it's just something that should exist, you know, out exteriorly, then and someone else can build it. And absolutely that's what should happen. But um, everything we've built thus far, we see very concrete, you know, synergies of having this both be uh, within the protocol. Um, yeah. We're not, we're not just building whatever because we want as many different things as possible. It's like these are all things that we very explicitly have like a, uh, you know, see uh, synergizing as us being the ones building both of them. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And so we asked Drake this when he came out a few months ago, but what's it like day to day working with the Frax team? Um, like what's, what's it like, how do you guys function? Cause I've called you guys like the seal team six of devs. <laughs> like literally you guys are just like, there's only like eight of you guys. You're like, someone's always up and like, you guys are just like grinding, working and of course shipping. And so like, what's it like working on the Frax team? Yeah. All right. We, uh, uh, kind of just go. I mean, we have a uh, kind Let's of audience. Go twice a week where we, you know, ideate and kind of plan what's needs to be built and what's whatever. And then we split up the work and, uh, you know, everyone you know, kind of, I don't know, sets out their, their tasks for the, for the sprint or for the week or, and, you know, says I'm building this, I'm working on this, I'm working. It's all, it's all, you know, it's not planned. It's like, I'm doing a bad job of explaining. This. No, no, you're literally like still, you're explaining like still team six right now. Cause they <laughs> operate us just like, one unit like nothing's planned but everybody's autonomously like it, it is, knows it is their planned. place like the, the roadmap is very explicit the, of like what what we're building and like what major things need to be worked on but it's like i guess what i mean by we just go is like uh most of the time it's just it's just building you know it's like yeah it's like we're uh like yeah we're just we're just busy we're just busy <laughs> we're, just, we're just shipping how many people are is working on the Frax ETH with you, Jack? Um, so yeah, that that's also a good point. Is like we have like kind of like leads, like you know, Frax Lend is Drake, Frax Swap is Rich, Frax ETH is is myself, um, and you know, we kind of have like, uh, you know, who are kind of the main person mm -hmm. kind of pushing that project. Uh, but then ultimately, like the whole team will will help with Frax ETH, you know. I've recently had a lot of like, like recently Travis has helped me ship like a lot of code. Um, early, early on, I was working with, uh, with Nodder, uh, Drake and Rich both did audits. Drake helped me design a couple of things. Uh, Sam and Dennett have both like helped design things like all, all, all sorts of like, uh, um, everyone, it's kind of all hands on every product. It's yeah, like, so like, Brands are working together on one thing, but then like as far as the day to day, the one thing that's usually just like one or two. Oh, people. okay. So like there's like one lead, and then like when you need help or if someone sees something, they'll like jump in and like do their thing, and then hop yeah. out and do whatever they're doing. Or we'll all collectively design it on our like you know all hands meetings and kind of like figure out the direction, and the vision, and it's like anytime that there's kind of like a fork, it's like should we do it this way, or this way? It's like the whole team kind of like collaborates and decides on it, but uh uh build wise usually just built by like two people and then later and then, but and then you know you run into a problem you go to the team you need audits the whole team looks at it like you know design choice whole team looks at it um, yeah you, you guys have a quite the extensive auditing um process because you guys mm -hmm. like get quarterly audits and then you guys have trail of bits and then i'm sure you guys look at it over and over again so mm -hmm. especially yeah, like with got, the, yeah we've got trail of bits coming yeah we've done recently our you know our uh we audit a, a ton, which is necessary because, you know, we ship so much and, uh, you know, we can't really afford hacks or we really, you know, not, no one can really, but, uh, you know, we're, we owe it to, you know, our community to, to, you know, make sure these things are hyper secure. Um, and so we've got, we've got trailer bits coming up in, I think like a week, um, or 
very 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 soon our like our um our, our regular trailer bits audit it um second one this year mm-hmm. uh yeah and then the we also have been doing uh code arena we've start you started using there was a code arena contest for uh frax lend um before that came out there we just did a code arena audit on frax eth um so yeah we're, we're there's audits happening and then also like individual audits we have a few like individual contractors or auditors that we reach out to and have looked over contracts as well as just like the team ourselves so we're like almost constantly having our things audited uh, it's like yes and check but like the checking is constant mm-hmm. yeah like uh constant checking and then like a massive push right when before launching something and, yeah. and maybe not guess and check i just got like thrown back to like no, fifth grade math. <laughs> more like build and check build and mm-hmm. check and it's like constantly being checked um cool cool um when frax eve when yeah. frax eve um very 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 soon we are soon TM. literally waiting on there is there is one the the front end is done the contracts are done uh the contracts may or may not be deployed i would also say but i don't know <laughs> don't don't ape into them yet because oh man we had check uh, the chain yeah, Donate. like they're being redeployed. Make sure we have all of our things exactly correctly, and then we have them at the address and whatever. But like, uh, code's done, front end's done, everything is literally done. Uh, we are waiting on a couple. I should not. Things. We're really waiting. On, I don't know. I want to. There's like um, some. We're waiting on the curve guys to. They're, they're making a couple fixes to their. Uh, or not a couple of things, a couple of changes to their kind of like pool system. So we want to make sure that those are done before we, you know, spin up our, our fax easy pool and mm-hmm. uh, soon have whatever, like potentially I, I would be surprised if fax ETH does not come out this week. Oh, Ooh. Ooh. So within okay. like the next, the next seven days or something. Yeah. I would say even maybe probably before the weekend. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, snap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, save your ETH. Save, actually, like, get your ETH ready and turn into Super ETH with Frax ETH. Yes, yes. No Chad more Virgin ETH. West. Fra- no more Virgin Chad, West. Chad yeah. ETH is, is free. <laughs> free. <laughs> Frax ETH. Free ETH. Um, free, free ETH for the people. Free <laughs> ETH that earns yield. That's Frax ETH. And it's been fun. Um, Dave, should we hop into our lightning round? Let's hop into the lightning round. All right, Jack. So, yeah, yeah. At <laughs> yeah, the dude. end of, of, of all the flywheels, we hit you with a couple one-two question real quick. So, Ooh. first question. You mentioned earlier you're, you know, you got into Bitcoin in 2017, but we want to know what was your first virgin crypto experience? And sexes don't count. <laughs> like, uh, uh, when did you, you touch the like, chain? Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. I see sexes don't count. I was like virgin sexes what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah 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 not that kind yeah, i first touched the chain spring of 2021 i uh actually that's not true i first i touched the bitcoin chain i i was playing with uh paper wallets and kind of like off centralized exchange uh like like swaps and things or like i don't know like i, I was using the bitcoin network back in 2017 from like a non-centralized exchange level which was quite fun uh i had uh let's see i I definitely sent eth places pretty early but i didn't really like uh maybe like i didn't i didn't touch like DeFi or like really get my hands dirty with like uh smart contracts until spring of 2021 and that was when i just decided i was going to just like playing around with DeFi farms and stuff or no that was i actually like before i even touched DeFi like like using it i realized that i wanted to be like a developer in it so it, it was like something just hit me. i had this like epiphany moment in uh spring of 2021 spring of 2021 when it was when all the like stimmy check bullshit was happening like all the like traditional fi- there was like gme was happening like amc was happening and there was all this like i, I was I, I don't know i always follow up markets very closely and i was just like seeing all this uh 
uh, what's a good word? I don't know. Problems with, you know, TradFi. Uh, you were seeing all these kind of like, you know, I think the stat was ridiculous, like 90% of all transaction volume happening in dark pools or I, I, I'm pulling numbers out of my ass, so forgive me. But um, all sorts of kind of big, you know, TradFi, Wall Street, uh, screwing over the little guy. And I, I you know, you had uh, markets freezing. You had, you had people, they turned, I remember they turned off. I remember seeing the picture of, like Robin Hood just like they turned off. Yeah. Me. And I was like, that's, I, I couldn't believe that this was like possible. And I had heard the, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Those are just kind of the flashy examples, I guess. But, um, I had heard the, you know, name, you know, decentralized finance, like floating around and, uh, kind of over the course of a few weeks, kind of like learned about all this stuff and realized that it was probably my future. Um, yeah. So, Land so of opportunity. I, Sweet. Yeah, so like before I was the chain even like of opportunity. Stuff I was like developing, which is kind of cool. Yeah, cool. So you okay. came in as like a dev. Second question: What is your favorite off-chain activity? What is your favorite yeah. touch grass activity? <laughs> oh man, what's grass? He's forgotten <laughs> the, the feel. Personal life. <laughs> that's, that's weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you shy. You shy. <laughs> yeah. my, my, I don't know. I like, let's see. I've, I've always been actually pretty like skeptical of like people with like hobbies, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you know like, like obviously I've got hobbies, but like if, if you ask someone, it's like, what do you, what do you like doing? And they give you like one hobby. It's like, it's like, okay. Like weirdo. <laughs> like you just like your whole life is just like one thing. Like seems kind of NPC behavior. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I guess if you just do like one thing, I guess like if, but if you have like multiple hobbies, like that's not so NPC. Cause I'm sure, you know, people are like multifaceted. So like, mm. like, I guess like, do you have any other like things that you're focusing on or do you just like have a tent on chain and you're just, you just like, ship codes. Your, that's all he does. You, you, know? just, you just codes. You just ride the <laughs> frag ferry and ship code. Yeah. He's <laughs> on the, you find him in like the barrel, find him in the bottom of the frag ferry with his validator yeah. shipping code. <laughs> one of those people that like live on the ferry because <laughs> once you have the ticket you don't really have to get off <laughs> uh, the no I, I do not just sit right here and write code 24 7 i mean it's it's pretty close but i'm also a i also have a life <laughs> <laughs> he also uh, has... <laughs> yeah, like, uh, uh, all your typical college student shit for one uh i like <laughs> I don't know. I do a lot of, I'm, I, I, I can't really stay focused on one thing for that long. Like, I don't know, one week it's, uh, I'm always, I'm always getting distracted with different side, side hobbies, quests, whatever. Um, side quests, side yeah. quests in the simulation, going past the NPCs. Mm, I think, um, I don't know. I think I'm a, I think I'm a pretty interesting person. <laughs> Can't give any examples though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested. He's your typical college kid. He has class. He goes to class. He goes to parties. But and behind the scenes, what people don't see is he's on the chain, on the prowl, and, and he's building the future for of France. Building the future of France. Uh, a last question on my end, Jack. Uh, is, oh wait, wait. Um, can I go? Can I go? Oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what is some advice you would give to yourself five years ago? Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, uh, one one good one is that I was thinking of recently. I don't I don't know if it's the piece of advice, but definitely one that I think is pretty good is like don't ever settle. Um, yes, I, I think I think I have like gained a lot in my life from realizing like oh you know this is pretty good, but you know that it can always be better. Like things can always be better. You can always be improving. You can always be doing something even cooler than you're already doing. Um, and this is why you and, don't have hobbies. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> about hobbies, I, just, I don't know, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, you should never be, and anytime I've been like, Oh, this is pretty good, but something just doesn't feel right about it. I have kept looking, you know, I've like, and I, I've had, I, I've been, uh, blessed enough and you know privileged enough that i've had that option where like i don't have to take the first thing that comes my way every single time you know like i have the freedom to go and like uh you know wait for something better or look for something better which not all people can say but when you have that ability um you know always 
take that when you think it's able because i i think generally in my life i have conviction when something is like the correct thing like uh you know generally if it's like generally when you know something is the right choice or the right whatever like i i know you know yeah and, uh, you have that gut feeling mm -hmm. and i've i i think uh that that's one of the best piece of advice i think i could give anyone it's like you know if you have that ability never settle for the thing that's like you don't think is all the way perfect because if you keep looking you keep pushing you keep whatever you'll find something better and never never be like satisfied almost i mean it's okay to be satisfied but like if you if you stay hungry you keep like you know there's there's always like a better scenario and you keep like punching higher and punching higher and like you know yeah i like to say like like for me personally i've always refused mediocrity just like mm -hmm. always don't settle refuse mediocrity like strive for the best absolutely and um one last question from my end is if you weren't working in crypto what would you be doing or studying or studying uh, <laughs> if i wasn't in crypto or studying or what would you career wise studying? career wise yeah career wise career wise I i've always jokingly told people that i'm just trying to like <laughs> uh save up enough money to just go like fuck off and be a cabbage farmer in tibet <laughs> uh i think like um uh i think that's like a common theme of like the cs guy who just like secretly wishes deep down he was just like a farmer <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that's probably what i'd be doing but i did i did actually live in this is a tangent but it's kind of cool maybe maybe this makes me seem more interesting i, I lived in nepal for like a month i like hiked the himalayas for like whoa uh, yeah i went to like every I like hiked all the way to like Everest base camp and there was like, there's just people farming cabbages and they're just, you know, they're just chilling. I can see myself doing that, <laughs> making up money to like go farm cabbages somewhere. Probably don't have, even have your ETH yields getting you that, re that revenue and then farming your cabbages to get you that food. Like <laughs> farming from, like two different you know, ways. Farming, farming on the chain, that. now farming the cabbage. All right. That's, that's Full circle. Though. I'd, I'd probably be working like I, i'd probably be doing i don't, I don't know I, i've always been like either my, my interests have always been either like finance or like you know tech and so i'd probably be elsewhere in fintech or like you know somewhere <laughs> in finance somewhere in you know whatever it's just like it's nice that i've kind of had the natural um, yeah combo it, of two things cool cool well jack thanks for coming on this has been a fun episode Lots of alpha drops on this one from Frax ETH to like everything else Frax's been cooking up in the Frax kitchen. Um, you know, hope to see you again. We'll see you on chain and excited for the release of Frax ETH. And wait, wait, can you give your socials so people can follow you? Oh, my social. Okay, I don't. My only. Wait, let me make sure I actually have the. Uh, <laughs> my only significant uh, social is, is my Twitter, which is just Jack Cordry. Uh, J C K C O R D D R Y. Uh, that's my Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Cordry on Telegram. I think that's also my GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> find uh, putting work on there. Yeah, I think I think yeah. Follow me on Twitter. I think that's really the main one. Yeah. <clears throat> Sweet. Cool. Thanks, Jack, for coming on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Jack, thanks for coming on this episode. It's been a lot of fun, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Hey guys, thanks for watching that episode of Flywheel Pod, where we gave you everything you need to know about Frax ETH, detail to detail, top to bottom, bottom to top. Kit, what was your favorite moment from this episode? Soon. Very, soon. very soon. <laughs> TM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, probably my favorite moment was the way that Jack articulated Frax ETH's place in Frax's DeFi stack and how the DeFi trinity plays into it, because... It really shows how the flywheel can be applied to different assets and decks. I think like the nerd in me gets super excited just hearing about that and hearing like devs talk about it from their perspective. Dude, the nerd in me got excited when he was saying how they could use the same bribe engine and just apply that onto the Frax ETH ETH pool and then create almost like this flooring on the ETH um, staking rewards that would be yeah. dramatically higher than everybody else's. That like, was super exciting. Like a yield today. machine, basically. Like, like a the, yield, the real yield machine. The real yield machine, yeah. 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 And so uh, 
everyone. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that bell button so you keep on getting those notifications, so you keep on getting that alpha. Don't forget to subscribe to us at FlywheelPod. Um, join our Telegram at FlywheelPod. Follow me on Twitter at DeFiDave. Follow me at 0 capital underscore K. And as always, as you see at the bottom of our information, everything said here today is not financial or tax advice. Everything here is strictly educational. And there's nothing here is an endorsement of anything. We're here to provide information and nothing else. Um, please, the, nothing here is a solicitation to buy or sell any assets or make any financial decisions. Nothing here is tax advice. Talk to your, your accountant and do your own research always. And we'll see you next time. Peace. What?